Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Ian Roth. Ian, nice to have you with us. Thank you, Tom. There are several valves in your heart that control the flow of blood from one part of the heart to another. And the mitral valve is located between the two chambers on the left side of your heart, called the left atrium and the left ventricle. There are several abnormalities that can affect the mitral valve, including mitral valve regurgitation, that is the valve leaks, and mitral valve stenosis, the valve is too narrow and restricts the flow of blood between the atrium and the ventricle. Mitral valve repair and mitral valve replacement are procedures that may be performed to treat diseases of the mitral valve. What treatment is best for you depends on the abnormality and how severe it is. Here to talk about mitral valve repair is Mayo Clinic interventional cardiologist, Dr. Peter Pollack. Dr. Pollack is the director of structural heart disease at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Welcome to the program, Dr. Pollack. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, nice to have you, Dr. Pollock, all the way from Jacksonville, Florida. Nice to have you up in, in Rochester. I'm sure you wish you were home now, but you're here. Oh, it's great good, to experience some winter. Good to have you in studio. So tell us about the heart valves. How many are there and what do they actually do? How do they function inside the heart? Well, as a reminder, the heart is divided top and bottom, left and right, to give us four chambers. So the top chambers are thin-walled receiving chambers. They're the atria. They collect blood and deliver it to the more muscular pumping chambers, the ventricles at the base of the heart. And with four chambers, we have four valves, and they're all designed to be perfect one-way valves. They allow blood to go forward without resistance. And then when the ventricles contract, they stop blood from flowing. Um, the opposite direction. So they shouldn't leak and they shouldn't provide any resistance going forward. So disease is when either of those things happen. As you just mentioned, if they start to leak, we call that regurgitation. If they start to narrow, we call that stenosis. And it can be either the right-sided valves, which are the tricuspid and pulmonic valve, or the left-sided valves, which are cause more symptoms because the left side of the heart receives blood from the lungs and pumps it out to the body. And so we get most of the valve treatments related to the aortic and mitral valve, the valves on the left side of the heart. Uh, and why do they become diseased? Well, uh, it depends on the valve and the nature of the condition. There are a number of different things that can cause valve disease. Far and away, valve disease is a disease of aging. It's one of the things that you don't do to yourself, but just happens if you live long enough. Like uh, everything else, they wear out. <laughs> indeed, indeed. About 10 to 15 percent of people over age 70 or 75 will have moderate to severe or severe valvular heart disease. So how, how would you know what are the signs and, and symptoms that you have heart uh, disease of the valve? So predominantly, it's going to be an exertional limitation. So you'll feel short of breath because the pressure of the left ventricle trying to pump blood out to the body, in the case of mitral regurgitation, that pressurized blood is now leaking back to the left atrium where blood was collecting from the lungs. So that pressurized blood raises the pressure in the left atrium, raises the pressure in the lungs, and we feel elevated pressure in the lungs as shortness of breath. So uh, shortness of breath is one of the cardinal symptoms of all valvular heart disease. Also fatigue, although fatigue is a difficult symptom, as you know, because so many different things can feed into a sense of fatigue. Sure. And so how do you nail down the diagnosis? Uh, in today's day and age, it's going to be the history and physical exam first and foremost. And then echocardiography is the way that we look at the valves. And with echocardiography, we use ultrasound technology from the outside of the heart. We can, outside of the chest, we can look at the heart, see the valves moving in real time, and we can use color Doppler to see if there's leaking. We can measure the speed of blood through the valves. Just like when you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose, as a valve narrows, the speed of blood going through the valve increases. And so we can measure the speed of blood using the Doppler principle. And faster blood means a narrower valve, whether it's the aortic or mitral valve that started to narrow. You know, most internists still carry a stethoscope. Can you actually hear what, that there, there's an abnormality with one of the valves using the stethoscope? Absolutely. And that's the first way that we're going to uh, recognize valvular heart disease is through the presentation of a murmur. And a murmur, just like we, we talk about a purr, when a cat purrs, that's a pleasant sound of something good. A murr is an unpleasant sound historically. <laughs> and so while I like listening to murmurs, because I'm a valvular heart disease doctor, um, a murmur is a, is a sound of blood rushing through a heart valve, and it signifies some degree of valvular heart disease. The typical uh, flow of, of care will be that you complain of a symptom, 
Your doctor may be concerned about valvular heart disease. They listen to your chest with a stethoscope. They hear a murmur. And then to better characterize what's going on beyond what they can tell just from hearing is to look with echocardiography. Is it, I mean, if you figure out that there is a valve problem, are you, is it always going to require treatment? Or are there things that we can do kind of settle things down without having to actually take interventional action? Absolutely. Many valve leaks or mild narrowings are now found incidentally. So someone may hear a murmur, they may, or, or they may get an echo for another reason, and then we see mild mitral regurgitation. As a rule, mild valvular pathologies do not require treatment. We define valve disease as severe when the benefit of treatment really outweighs the risks of the treatment. And so it can be difficult to decide, well, you have some valvular heart disease and you have some shortness of breath, but is it really due to that valve disease? So for patients who may have been told or they read on their ECHO report, oh, mild aortic regurgitation or mild mitral regurgitation, mild tricuspid regurgitation, these are, are valve conditions that generally are, are monitored. We provide reassurance. They don't necessarily require treatment. So. And if the symptoms are bad enough, then mm -hmm. what, what can be done? So uh, the cardinal uh, indication for, for example, treatment of the mitral valve is going to be, as well as treatment of the aortic valve, these are going to be when the symptoms are related to severe valvular pathology. So we see severe valvular pathology and symptoms that are due to that valvular pathology, then we want to treat the valve. With the mitral valve, if we take mitral regurgitation, for example, it also depends on why the mitral valve is leaking. And we broadly categorize mitral valve leaking into two reasons. Because the mitral valve is attached to the left ventricle, it can leak either because the valve itself is broken, we call this flail or, or a prolapsing valve where the valve has started to stretch and the leaflets no longer come together normally. We call that primary mitral regurgitation because it's primarily a problem of the valve itself. That is generally best treated by mitral repair. So that's a surgical procedure. It can now be done by surgical experts using robotic repairs that shorten the length of stay and allow you to recover more quickly. Robotic repair? Indeed. So they use either the da Vinci robot or thoracoscopic techniques to avoid the uh, sternotomy so they don't have to open the chest completely. And that allows you to kind of recover from the procedure uh, much more quickly, so a much shorter length of stay. So you put something actually inside the heart, through the skin, through the ribs, mm -hmm. and can repair the valve that way? Yes, yes. Not not me particularly, but but um, the Someone. surgeons that do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, but can you also repair it through a catheter, percutaneous? Yes, and so we have uh, technologies to repair mitral valves using a technology called the mitral clip system, and this is a specific system that goes through the vein of the the right leg up to the chambers of the right side of the heart. We poke across into the left atrium and steer this, and it's kind of like a. a uh, an oversized binder clip. It clips the anterior and posterior leaflets of the, the mitral front valve and back. together. The front, front and back. back. So we, by kind of stapling the two leaflets together, where they are leaking, we eliminate or reduce the amount of leak from the mitral valve, and patients feel better without having to go through any open chest procedure. That's really for patients who are not going to do well with a surgical procedure. So for younger patients, who can recover well from a surgical repair, that's still the gold standard for durability and, and recovery. For older patients that are frail or would not recover well from heart surgery, we have this catheter-based option that allows them to feel better right away, go back and recover at home. Uh, and our typical course for a patient is they come in, they have the procedure, procedure takes a couple of hours, Amazing. they go home the next day, if the, if the valve is bad enough and you have to replace it, does that require an open surgical procedure? Uh, there are minimally invasive approaches to uh, replacing the valve as well, um, but not robotic per se. All right. So it uh, basically happens in older individuals and the treatment options, uh, you've got a lot of them. Some of them you can do with a robot. Some of them you can do through a catheter and occasionally it requires opening the chest and actually replacing the valve. That's true. I would want to mention there are some uh, younger patients who do develop uh, valvular heart disease and they would be folks who are born with an abnormal heart valve. If they develop infection on a heart valve, um, this can cause um, injury to the heart valve and require replacement when they're younger. 
Uh, and then some patients have a, a what we call a fibroelastic deficiency, or they have a connective tissue uh, difference, and this promotes degeneration of their valves earlier in life, particularly of the mitral valve. And so this is more commonly in patients in their 50s or 60s rather than their 70s or 80s where more patients will develop mitral valve uh, disease. Fortunately, relatively rare in younger people. Yes, much much less common than, than age-related or, or senile valvular degeneration. Um, Our, we've been talking about uh, mitral valve disease and repair with a Mayo Clinic expert, Dr. Peter Pollock. Time for a short break. When we come back, We'll talk about another structural heart problem, a hole in the heart that normally closes after birth in most people, but when it doesn't close, it's called a patent foramen ovale. That's next. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Ian Roth. We are talking with Mayo Clinic interventional cardiologist, Dr. Peter Pollock, Director of Structural Heart Disease at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. A patent foramen ovale, or PFO, is a hole in the heart that didn't close the way it should after birth. PFO occurs in about 25% of the normal population. The hole never completely closes. But most people with the condition don't even know they have it. So, Dr. Pollock, again, good to have you with us. So, we are all born with a hole in our heart? Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> and yes, we are. It is... The PFO uh, is really more of a flap than a hole. And we all have this before we're born. And let me explain why we have this. Not a design flaw. It should no. be there. It should be there, and I'll explain why. So okay. if we think about it, before we're born, we can't breathe. We're in a fluid-filled bag, the amniotic sac. And so our lungs aren't doing the same kind of work they're doing once we're born. We get all of our oxygenated blood from mom through the placenta. So it's coming down the umbilical cord, coming into our what's now our belly button, so coming up from underneath the heart. And the heart, as it's developed, is designed to take that flow of oxygenated blood from underneath the heart and deflect it at the thin wall that separates the two top chambers. So the right atrium receives what's normally venous blood, but in this case is richly oxygenated blood from underneath the heart. And there's a little ridge of tissue called the eustachian ridge, and it deflects that oxygen-rich blood from mom through the wall between the two chop chambers, which grow from either side and kind of overlap. And so there's a flap between them and this constant flow of blood holding that flap open over to the left side, which is supposed to be the oxygen rich side and where it can get pumped out to the body. Now, when we're born and we meet the world, and if you're in Minnesota, it's a cold place. <laughs> and so we cry. And if we don't cry, they kind of stimulate the kid to make them cry because they got to fill their lungs with air and expand their lungs for the first time and we cut the umbilical cord. And when we cut the umbilical cord, all of a sudden there's a lot less flow of blood coming to the right side of the heart because that flow is no longer there. And now we've expanded the lungs, a lot of blood flow goes to the lungs. So the pressure with all that blood now going to the lungs, the pressure on the right side of the heart drops in comparison to the left and that flap then seals. But it seals in most people. Now you gotta think that 25% of the world's population, about two billion people, and statistically that means someone in this room. <laughs> has a PFO, and that is a lot of people. That means 25% of people with any condition are likely to have a PFO. And most people walking around don't know. You can't hear it on exam, doesn't cause any problem normally. So the vast majority of people, it's just there. It doesn't require anything besides reassurance if it's found and hasn't caused a problem. But it is a potential source for problems if something goes through that potential connection. So if that flap opens, if if the pressure on the right side of the heart is ever higher than the left side of the heart, for example, if you cough, gag, retch, bear down, that can push temporarily the pressure on the right side of the heart to be higher and then bump that flap open so that if something such as venous blood or if there are little bits of clot in that venous blood, they could transit through the PFO and get over to the arterial side, the left side, where they can go to anywhere in the body. And cause a stroke, for example. Yes, yeah, so we, we call that paradoxical embolism. If a, a small bit of clot moves from the right side through the PFO to the left side, it doesn't have to, if it goes to the brain, we call it a stroke, it plugs up a blood vessel and, and causes injury to, to brain tissue. That's a, a paradoxical embolism that causes a stroke. If it, it could go to anywhere in the body, though, um, it just, these tend to be, 
uh, smaller size clots. And, and so the most noticeable place for a smaller size clot to go would be the brain. And how do you figure out that it was a problem, that, that the PFO was the source of the, of the disease? Well, and that is, that is the real challenge. And so our approach here at Mayo Clinic is very collaborative. And what we advocate for is that you work with a neurology. So we have these heart-brain clinics where folks like me, or cardiologists, work hand-in-hand -hand with a, a stroke neurologist, a vascular neurologist, to really evaluate patients and figure out, was the PFO an incidental finding, an innocent bystander, or was it a potential culprit? Was this really likely to be a stroke that was caused by paradoxical embolism? Does doing device closure of the PFO, is that going to decrease the risk of a recurrent stroke? We can't do anything about the stroke that happened, but can we reduce the likelihood that this patient with a PFO is going to have a, a second or a third event? So 25% of people might have this. The things that you described that can cause problems are, are pretty routine or mundane things. That seems kind of alarming. Is this something that people could or should go get tested? Should I know if I have a PFO in case something like that happens to me? I would say no. I think we don't <laughs> screen for something that's so common. Now, I do think that that people, especially younger folks, um, if they've had a stroke, they should you should look to see whether they have a PFO. But you should also look to make sure that it isn't due to anything else. Now, a word about aging. It's interesting because you have this PFO your whole life. You've had it since before you were born. But we know that closure of PFOs is less likely to be helpful in preventing recurrent events as you get older because every other cause for stroke gets more common. So atrial fibrillation is more common, atherosclerosis in the aorta, in the carotids, in the cerebral vasculature, they get more common. Hypertension as a cause for stroke gets more common. So all of those other causes of stroke get more common as you get older. And so the benefit is really limited to folks who are younger than 60 or younger than 55 years of age. So an unexplained stroke in a young individual might suggest that they have a patent for amino valley. You should look for it. And if they do, and they have no other alternate explanation for their stroke, then a collaborative uh, approach to figuring out is this person likely to benefit from PFO closure should be undertaken. And those are the patients who are most likely to benefit from preventing a recurrent event based and, on the data. And how do you do that? So it's a, uh, we, we create kind of a sandwich. There are two different kinds of devices, but they both work fundamentally the same way. There's a disc that is placed on the left atrial side, a disc that opens on the right atrial side, and they close with that flap of tissue in the middle and they hold it closed. The body grows over the, both of the discs on either side. It stays with you. It's permanently part of the heart. And this is done in the cath lab. It's a procedure with a very high success rate, a very low complication rate. Uh, patients stay overnight, tend to go home the next day, and then we monitor afterwards. So you don't have to open up the heart to, to fix the defect? No, this is done with catheters in the cath lab. Uh, patients are kind of sleepy, but not all the way asleep. They have to breathe on their own. Un incredible. You do it through a catheter that you snake up through the groin and you can close that defect. The real challenge with PFO is identifying the right patient because it's so common. I think you have to do a diligent evaluation and a collaborative evaluation with neurology to figure out which are the patients that are most likely to benefit from PFO closure. All right. Well, we've learned a lot about PFO and 25% of us have it, but hopefully only a small number of us will ever have a stroke because of it. I agree. I agree. We've been talking about heart defects and valve disease with Mayo Clinic cardiologist, Dr. Peter Pollack. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Pollack. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Good to have you. Thanks, Dr. Pollack.